Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who believes in me will never die. And hear these words of greeting, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Together we join our voices to sing the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. It's number two in your hymnals. Hymn number two, Holy, Holy, Holy. We will sing verses one, two, and four. Verses one, two, and four, omitting verse three, the congregation may rise to sing. have come together this morning to praise God, to witness to our faith, and to give thanks for the life of Arlo Doc Newman. We come together in sadness, acknowledging our loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restores our life in baptism so many years ago. Doc was sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Together we hear these words from the Ministry of Music, Amazing Grace, by Rosalind DeCoster and Pam DeHaan.
as far and grace will lead me home lead me home when we Comforter, you are our refuge and strength, a helper close at hand in times of distress. You forgive what we have done and what we have left undone. Your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Help us so to hear the words of our faith that our fear is dispelled, our loneliness eased, our hope reawakened. May your Holy Spirit lift us above our sorrow to the peace and light of your constant love. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. And together, God's people said, Amen. Friends, here are these words from the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. For everything, there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And these words from John's Gospel, John chapter 14 verses 1 through 6. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples as he's preparing uh, for his upcoming death, for his upcoming crucifixion. He speaks these words to his very closest followers. He says this. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am going there, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in light of those words of Jesus, together we sing hymn number 622, 622, what a friend we have in Jesus. We will sing verses 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2, not verse 3, we'll remain seated as we sing what a friend we have in Jesus.
these words from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd. Does it ever strike you that sometimes it's the most old-fashioned, antiquated imagery that is also the most comforting? The Lord is my shepherd? Shepherd? Uh, We may be familiar with farmers, but shepherds? Shepherds, those who live nomadic existences, traveling from place to place so that the sheep may safely graze. Now that's a rather old-fashioned word. And yet, despite the irrelevance of the term, despite the fact that the word seems just beyond our grasp of understanding, these are some of the most well-known words in all of Scripture. These are the words that when people are in need of some sort of equilibrium in the face of the nauseating twists and turns of grief, these are the words that people come home to. The Lord is my shepherd. Next to John 3, verse 16, I can't think of a more well-known passage by those within the church as well as those outside the church alike. And next to Romans 8, 38 and 39, I can't think of a more oft-spoken passage at a funeral. One might think that with the advent of the technological age and the industrialization of farming, the metaphorical language of Psalm 23 would become outdated, old-fashioned, passé. Not so much. For these words, this imagery, still mean something for us, something real, something true, even something profound. I have knelt by many an elderly person's bedside, begun reading these words unannounced, and by the time I get to the is that bridges the Lord and my shepherd, the elderly person who seemed so lifeless and unaffected by my cheery greeting moments earlier is nodding his or her head in affirmation. The Lord is my shepherd. When we say the Lord is my shepherd, what's true, of course, is that God, first of all, cares for us. God watches over us, God provides for us, God protects us, and because that's so, because God cares, the psalmist naturally concludes that I shall not want. Other translations say it more succinctly, I lack nothing. The psalmist reminds us that our self-worth is not based upon our own intelligence or ingenuity or inner strength, our self-worth is based upon God, the one who is our shepherd. Because God is our shepherd, we don't need anything else, period. Notice, David doesn't shy away from carrying the shepherd metaphor all the way through the psalm. Because if God is a shepherd, God is the best kind of shepherd. One who makes me lie down in green pastures, one who leads me beside still waters, one who restores my soul, one who leads me in right paths, for his name's sake. The Lord is my shepherd. God cares. But that's not all, for God also acts on his caring. God comforts. The psalmist goes on to write, even though I walk through the darkest valley, some translations say the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice, despite what some of our television preachers tell us, life is not always easy for people of faith. Life was not easy for Moses, life was not easy for David, and life was most certainly not easy for the one we're called to follow, for Jesus. While at times we are blessed to travel over some mountainous highways of majesty and delight, at others 
we find ourselves traversing through the cavernous tunnels of difficulty and despair. And yet even there, God affirms, David affirms that God is with him. The shepherds, rod and staff, they comfort him. God cares, God comforts, and finally, God's caring, God's comforting meets a conclusion. God completes. God achieves and accomplishes. God carries out and God consummates. God completes. Listen carefully. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The God who cares, the God who comforts, the God who promises to bring creation to completion so that all of God's beloved lambs might dwell in the shepherd's stead forever. In fact, the God who prepares a table before David in Psalm 23 is the same God who promises to prepare a place for each one of us. In Jesus' words that I read earlier from John chapter 16, how does Jesus say it? He says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Indeed, the shepherd who cares, comforts, completes, does so through the person of Jesus, the Savior who prepares a place for us, the Savior who takes us to himself, the Savior who is the way, the truth, and the life. Doc Newman was a lover of animals and people, a lover of telling stories and learning stories, and most of all, a lover of God and a believer in God's call. It didn't take a person a long time to figure out that once you interacted with Doc, he was a man serious about his life's work both as a veterinarian and as a horseman. As a young person, he learned the value of hard work, the importance of an honest day's work, and the gift of an honest day's pay. To be sure, Doc loved animals. Why else would he have given his life to veterinary medicine and horses? But nearly every time he told me a story about some animal he treated or helped save, there was also a person behind that animal. A person who meant something to Doc. A person who Doc wanted to honor and help. Technically, most would probably say that Doc was in the animal business, but I don't think that's how he saw it. He knew that, though the animals were certainly a significant part of God's creation, they were subservient to the men and women and children Doc felt called to serve. Doc always sought to honor people whether through the gift of the pork that he smoked for his neighbors or his intentional ways of thanking all those who had provided meaningful care in his life, Doc loved people well, and that most especially included his family. I love the story that Doc's granddaughters told yesterday about how when they were little, they would visit their grandparents. Doc, who had a thick tuft of hair near his forehead, would often allow his grandchildren to put barrettes in his hair. Given Doc's rugged work ethic, driven to establish a successful business built on honesty and integrity, I find it delightful that he found ways to be playful, to establish connection with the grandchildren he most certainly loved. Doc was always grateful for you, family, for your care, for your concern, for the way you had built and established your own lives. I once asked him if it was difficult to live so far from family. Oh, not really, he said. I'm really proud that my children have been able to establish lives of their own. Doc meant that, and that's so because he loved you. Doc also loved to tell stories. His book, Get Up, Get Going, is chock full of story after story, of encounter after encounter, of experience after experience. It's incredible, really. You should read it if you haven't. At one point, early in our tenure, uh, serving as pastors here, Doc underwent a prolonged stay in the hospital for an infection in his back. I remember going to the hospital to visit 
Typically, my pastoral calls to visit a hospital patient last 10 to 20 minutes. I was told in seminary, get in, check in, share the word, pray a blessing, and get out. But in my very first encounter with Doc Newman, what would have normally been a 10 to 20 minute visit quickly gave way to a 45 to 60 minute conversation. He loved to tell stories of people he'd met, of places he'd been, of unique experiences he had encountered. But as much as he loved to tell stories, he also loved to learn stories. Doc was the consummate learner. He listened well. He approached nearly every situation with a posture of curiosity. He was willing to subject himself to the stories of others. We see this perhaps most of all in his love for history in his lifelong investment in learning the stories of others. And what's even more, Doc was the kind of person that believed everyone he encountered had something to offer, a word to share, a perspective to be lovingly listened to. And, most of all, Doc was a lover of God, a believer in God's call. That was one of the most delightful things about being one of Doc's pastors. He could share a story about a remarkably dangerous encounter about nearly losing his life in an accident or a, quote, chance encounter with a wild animal. And every time, he found a way to speak about God, to name God in a way that wasn't trite or filled with saccharine sentimentality. No, Doc always spoke of God and his relationship with God in ways that were simple, yet profound, inherently experiential, and yet authentically thoughtful. For Doc... God was not some genie in a bottle. No, God was a provider, a protector, a caregiver, a caretaker, a guide, and a friend. I love the way that Doc ended his book with an epilogue titled, Something to Think About. I can almost hear him say those words. He talks about a terrible accident he once encountered north of Orange City, an accident in which two people actually died, and Doc barely survived. During his time in the hospital, the Reverend Dr. Henry Kohlenbrander, pastor of First Reformed Church, visited Doc every day. The church was across the street from the hospital, and many of Pastor Kohlenbrander's parishioners were farmers who used Doc's veterinary practice. Doc confessed to the pastor that he wondered why his life was spared in the accident. Why did he live when others had died? And Dr. Kohlenbrander's answer was simple, forthright, and hopeful. The Lord has saved you to do some good thing. Years later, when the accident continued to occupy so much of his attention, Doc would be called to treat a sick cow, a cow that was beyond treatment. And it was in that moment, with the accident swirling in his mind, consuming his imagination, that Doc had an earnest and honest conversation with God. And God spoke back to him. Get up. Get going. But there was one other time when Doc heard God's voice. It was when he was in the hospital after his accident. It was the voice, as he writes about in his book, of a young man. The hospital staff dismissed this, for no one had been in the room. But Doc heard it. He heard the voice. He heard God's messenger. And the voice recited his favorite psalm. Psalm 23 was imparted to me, Doc would write. And I was reassured everything would be all right. Indeed, Doc knew everything would be all right. For he knew that his was a life in the hand of the God of whom David sings in Psalm 23. The God who cares, the God who comforts, the God who completes. Doc knew of this God, revealed in the person and work of Jesus, the one through his life, death, and resurrection promises us abundant life in the here and now, and life eternal in the time to come. In a few moments, we'll stand at the graveside and confess the words of the creed. We'll say that we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. All of which is to say, out there, it's springtime. But in the church, in the real world, it's Eastertide. We're in a season where we're reminded of the most remarkable sign of new life. Not in blooming flowers, not in blossoming trees, not in budding grass. No, the most remarkable sign of new life comes to us in the risen Christ. 
Ours is a God who knows his way out of the grave. And not only that, one day at the final trumpet, God promises to help us find our way out of our graves too. So thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for the life and witness of Arlo John Doc Newman, for his love for animals and people, his love for telling stories and learning stories, and for his faith, his love for God and believe in God's call. And, and thanks be to God for the one to whom his life points, Jesus, the Christ, the one who lived and died and was raised from death and promises to raise us from death to life one day too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, we welcome Rosalind and Pam as they lead us in the ministry of music, You'll Never Walk Alone. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up. saints, O oh God, who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed, thy name, O oh Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thou wast their rock, their fortress, and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight. Thou in the darkness drear their one true light. Alleluia. Alleluia. O oh, blessed communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle, they in glory shine, yet all are one in thee, for all are thine. Alleluia, alleluia. O oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true, and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of old and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Alleluia, alleluia. But lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day, the saints' triumphant rise in bright array, the King of glory passes on his way. Alleluia, alleluia. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Together we join our voices to sing hymn number 242. Hymn number 242, In the Garden, will remain seated as we sing verses 1 and 3. Verses 1 and 3 of hymn number 242.
remembrances. Dr. Arlo Newman, age 96 of Orange City, passed away of congestive heart failure on Friday, May 12, 2023, at the Orange City Area Health System. Arlo John was born to Frederick Carl Newman and Nettie Adele Mabel Newman on June 24, 1926, in Preston. Growing up in the serene farm town of Preston, he was instilled with a tireless work ethic and an abiding love for animals and history, which would serve as the foundation for his illustrious career. At the young age of 16, he completed his high school education and went on to pursue veterinary science at Iowa State University. However, he was drafted into the United States Army in 1945 and served as a surgical technician at various locations stateside during World War II. After the war, he returned to Iowa State University and completed his degree. On November 5, 1950, Arlo exchanged wedding vows with Mary Virginia Prather at the First Methodist Church in Ames. The couple made their home in Orange City, where they raised their three children and built a life filled with love, joy, and cherished memories. Their commitment to each other and their family was unwavering, and their legacy of love will continue to inspire those who knew them. Mary passed away on August 28, 2014 in Orange City after more than 63 years of marriage. As a well-respected veterinarian, he relentlessly served farm families in Northwest Iowa for many years. When he retired from his general livestock practice, he shifted his focus to equine medicine where he quickly gained renown as the go-to horse doctor, affectionately known as Doc. His expertise and dedication to animal care will always be remembered by the many people and animals whose lives he touched throughout his remarkable career. Doc's contributions to the veterinary profession went beyond his practice. He was an active member of the American Reformed Church and the American Legion. His passion for horses led him to write for the Draft Horse Journal for more than 20 years, as well as teach clinics across the United States and Canada. He also served on the board of directors for the Belgian Draft Horse Corporation for three consecutive three-year terms. Doc's work with draft horses took him and his wife Mary around the world, where they met many distinguished people. Later in life, he chronicled his experiences in an enthralling memoir titled Get Up, Get Going, Tales of a Country Veterinarian. The book contains his favorite stories and teachings, culminating with the most significant lesson of all, that there's no such thing as luck. God's plan is already in place. With a zeal for history, Doc amassed an impressive collection of artifacts that captured the essence of agriculture, the Civil War, and Native American culture. He was determined to preserve the lessons of the past and maintain a significant assortment of steam engines and agricultural tools for horses. In addition to his love for history, Doc was an avid hunter and fisherman who pursued his passions with fervor. As we reflect on his life and legacy, we remember him not only for his impressive achievements, but also for his exceptional contributions as a mentor and teacher to many. His genuine interest in and compassion for everyone he met left a profound impact on their lives and spirits. Doc's passion for history was infectious, and his dedication to its preservation was unwavering. His kindness and generosity towards those around him were a testament to his character, and he will be deeply missed by all who had the honor of knowing him. Doc's influence extended beyond his family, and his legacy will live on through the countless lives he touched. Survivors include his three children, Linda Newman of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, David Newman and his wife, Barb Benson of Libby, Montana, and Penny Newman Alley and her husband, Martin Alley of Vass, North Carolina, seven grandchildren, Corey, Stephanie, and Lindsay Trimble, Greta and her husband, Andrew Jensen, and Kristen, Eric, and Nicholas Newman, three great-grandchildren, Kenley and Asher Jensen, and Freya Newman, and his brother and sister, Carl Newman, and Karen Impen, both of Clinton. In addition to his parents and wife, he was preceded in death by a granddaughter, Sybil Newman, two brothers, Daryl Newman and Fred Fritz Newman, and his four sisters, Marjorie Driscoll, Cleo Leslie, Shirley Jalepsi, and Nancy Flood. Thanks be to God for the life and witness of Doc Newman. At this time, we'd like to welcome uh, anyone who would like to share a brief remembrance uh, if you have a longer story to share, that might be more appropriate to share downstairs uh, following the committal uh, during the coffee time. But if you have a, a brief uh, story that you'd like to share, you're welcome to come to the mic this morning and, and share a bit.
remember about vision. My skin was turning to bronze. He couldn't see my fingers. I mean, you know his, like, bright blue eyes, right? Like, just, like, this crystal blue ocean. Um, but they also had so much curiosity and love in them. And any time we'd come over, and, you know, he'd just light up, and he'd go to share stories about so many of you, I'm sure I've heard. Um, even though I might not know your face, I know the stories that you've shared. And he just always was thinking. You know, we'd go out to lunch, and he'd be looking around, and we'd be sharing something, and then he'd have a story, and he just had this light in his eyes, and his mind was always moving. And I just, when I think about him and his smile and the twinkling in his eye of just curiosity and love that he had for everything he did, for his family, for sharing memories of everybody who touched his life. Um, It means so much to see everybody here today and to put some of those stories to faces and just to remember him all together. Well, thank you so much for being here and when we remember the twinkle and love um, in his eye and the curiosity that he shared about all of us. Hi, my name is Sue Regan. I was Doc's neighbor and friend. And um, I know that most of you are aware that Doc served uh, in World War II during 1945 and 1946. But I was going to accompany him on his Midwest Honor Flight, and it would have been this past Tuesday. Uh, And unfortunately, he passed away before that could happen. Uh, We were very excited to honor him and his service, and um, he was so humble about his service. He said, well, I really didn't do much uh, because, you know, uh, the war was over when I uh, finally got in, and but he helped at a number of locations, helped uh, POWs and our injured soldiers here in the U.S., and I just know that he was very proud of his military service, and you will see in the the memorial video that he was wearing his hat, and he had it ready to go, and uh, I'm pretty sure he passed away thinking he was going on his honor flight, and I'm very happy for that, and uh, I just want to honor his military service and say how thankful we are that he served as a World War II veteran. Good morning, everyone. I'm related to Doc through marriage. Um, My wife was his niece, and um, we also were extended where he grew up in Preston. So one story that I wanted to tell about Doc is his entrepreneurism, I'll call it. About eight, ten years ago, and Bob Mao can help me with this, Doc and Bob put a John Deere planter together that was pulled by horses. And I was selling them some corn seed at the time uh, through a company that I worked for. Anyhow, make a long story short, as you predicted, which is awful hard for me to do. Um, I videotaped that planting of that four-team horse planter. Bob and Doc put together a battery operated to raise the um, markers up and down with their foot. They rode on it in the back. The horses, of course, were up front. Somewhere, the family, that video is around somewhere. I don't know where it's at. Um, 
But uh, what I guess really impressed me about Doc is his thinking um, on things that a lot of people would not think about and how he would put things together from little or nothing. Um, and the horse loving that he had has impressed me ever since I've met him. So, Carl, David, Linda, Penny, the rest of the family, um, Bob, gonna miss him? He was a hell of a man. Thanks. into my life when I was two years old. He came to our farm to help my dad with a cow, pig, I don't know what it was then. But he kept coming for coffee on his way past because there was always coffee ready. My mom always had a bowl of cold popcorn, cold buttered popcorn. Now who would have that? But he ate some and then he ate some more and then he'd stop by just to get some popcorn. <laughs> but that kind of went on for several years. But he worked with my dad. Uh, my dad died at 47 early, but he had a lot of memories with Doc Newman. Doc got his new gun with its big scope on the front. I know he was so proud of that. Came out to show it to my dad. They, he shot it off and then offered it to my dad to shoot. Well, dad never shot one of those. And he had to mark around his eye to prove it. And, but Doc always had a story and I felt through the years, though I grew up, I was very blessed to spend some time with Doc as an adult, with children of my own, grandchildren. And I brought my great-grandson along to meet Doc Newman. I'm sorry I forgot your name, but the one who made the apple pie for Doc to serve to us was wonderful. And we talked about that, how gracious he was to have that ready for us, because all, all he wanted to do was visit. He had poked my sister-in-law in the back of the church, right about there, and said, if that old Rhonda ever gets up here, you tell her to come over to see me. So I did, and I introduced my grandson, my great-grandson, who's a little Hollander, by the way, is to Doc Newman. And he was absolutely overwhelmed with the stories, the things Doc had on his wall, from the nine-foot black, <laughs> black coyote, or whatever that thing was. <laughs> a great big bear, all these Indian things. But when we left, my husband shook his hand. He said, it was nice to see you again, Doc, because Doc showed up at my brother's funeral, my mother's funeral, my dad's funeral. And that's where we'd see each other. But to see him sitting around his table, drinking his coffee, <gasps> that was a little strong for me, but that's okay. And talk about the good old days and the horses and the time he t tried to save my horse. He was only a year old, but they put a, a board shaped like his leg. They were going to save him with his broken leg. 
They couldn't. His heart failed. And there was my dad with a hose down, the, down that pony's mouth and Doc going, mm, mm, on the stomach of that horse to get him to breathe. But they couldn't do it. But I want you to know that for all these years, Doc has had a place in our family. He's had a place in our hearts. He was a magnificent man. Thank you for sharing. You will have more opportunities to do that with a family uh, downstairs during the reception following the committal. Let's come before God in prayer. O oh God, from the dawn of the first day, you have cared for your people. By your hand we were created, and in your hand we live. To your hand we return again. You have revealed yourself in many ways until the fullness of time. Your word was made flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his death, resurrection, we find our calling in this world and our hope for the world to come. So we give you thanks for your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. We especially thank you for Doc, for the gift of his life, for the grace you gave him, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful. We thank you that for Doc, death is past, pain is ended, and he has entered the joy you have prepared for him in the company of all the saints. So God, give us faith to look beyond touch and sight, and in seeing that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, enable us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Arlo John Newman. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together we turn in our hymnals to hymn number 21, How Great Thou Art, hymn number 21. We will sing verses 1 and 4, verses 1 and 4 of hymn number 21. The congregation may rise to sing. <laughs>
find the benediction, the family will proceed out, we'll make our way to the cemetery, and then we'll turn back here for refreshments, light refreshments in the lower level fellowship hall. Receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.